UK, I'm a neurosurgeon. What's your name? Sherry Cohen. Sherry, um, I'm here to see you mostly really for consultation and also to examine you um, for the issues that we're about to discuss. We've already taken the history which you have told me and um, what I'm going to do now is to confirm the parts of the history on the examination in order to formulate what the problem may be. Tell me, what's, it, what, um, what's the date today? Um, September 11th, 2002. Do you know the month? September. September, the year? 2002. 2002. Very good. Do you remember what you had for breakfast today? Yes. Grape nuts and milk. Okay. Coffee. And um, what's the date of your mother's birthday? December 9th. Very good. Okay, I'm going to um, do some cranial nerve examination. In other words, I'm actually going to look at the cranial nerves as they come up from the head. It's going to really go from your eyes all the way down to, you know, your body to your feet. Okay. Um, the first thing that I usually would do is actually your sense of smell. Can you do you smell your food usually? Can you smell your food? And I have your, a good sense of smell. You could have a good sense of smell. Okay, very good. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is that I'm going to check your pupillary reaction. That would be the second cranial nerve. Okay, so the, I would actually, we would t t look at your pupil, it's reacting, look at the other side, see whether it's reacting. And then I'm going to do what you call the flashing light um, test, swinging from one eye to the other to determine whether you have um, Marcus gun pupil, which is really a test of, uh, of an optic nerve problem, which you don't. Your pupils are reacting very nicely. They are equal at um, three millimeters and reacting. And... Um, the other thing that goes with the pupil sometimes, I look to see whether your eyelid is um, down. Um, you don't have any ptosis, and um, if you actually look up, okay, you, you have full um, palpebral eyelid um, opening. Um, the other thing that I like to do is that I want to check your visual field, okay? And I usually would do that just standing in front of you. And um, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to have you cover one eye, okay? And I'm going to cover. Basically, we're testing one. You have to assume that my visual field is normal because this is a mutual thing, okay? So if you cover, and I'm going to cover one, okay? And I'm going to bring, you tell me when you first see the finger move. And you just point to the finger that's moving, okay? Okay. Both of them. Okay. Okay, now let's close the other one. I'm going to close it, and we're going to do the same, okay? Both of them? Good. I see this. Um, next, I'm going to um, look at your, your fundus, okay? The fundus is the optic nerve as it's actually leaving the, um, the retina, and I do that by using the ophthalmoscope, okay? And I'm going to shine light. All I'm going to do is just have you look at an ob fix at an object on the wall, okay? And then I'm going to come. Usually what I, this you can also use if you could just fix yeah. This uh, you could also do by when you shine the light, the light should actually give you the pupil reflex and see where there's also a red reflex um, on the eye, on the pupil. And once I do that, then I will start to approach the eye. Okay. And then right there, I'll see the, um, the fundus. Now, usually I would do it on both eyes. There's a situation where you can actually have papilledema in one eye and optic atrophy on, on the other side, and we actually call that Foster Kennedy syndrome. And um, it's not very common, but you know, don't be fooled by the fact that you just look at one optic nerve and think that the other one will be um, the same. The last part that I'll do will be to check your visual acuity. Okay, normally there's a there's a there's a chart on the wall that is much bigger, but for crude and testing, I put this about two feet, and normally we'll just have you read off it. Now, I know you wear glasses, then we usually I'll do with a corrected vision. So um, I'm sure you may. Can you read the first two words? Um, for two letters. S and H. Perfect. You're, you're fine. All right. So having done the um, second cranial nerve, now the, the, the next to do will be the third, fourth, and the sixth, which actually controls the extraocular um, muscles of the eye. And um, the way I do that is that I'll still stand in front of the patient. Usually it's a conjugate. You're checking both eyes at the same time because they move conjugately. So I usually will put a finger on your, okay, keeping your head steady. Do you see my finger? Yes. Okay, and it's sharp, and you have one, you just see one, correct? One finger. Okay, throughout the time that you're going to be moving to follow the finger, I'm also going to find out whether you see one finger or two fingers, because if you see two, then that means that there's double vision, 
and also I need to know whether the objects are horizontal to one another or whether they are stepped off in an oblique fashion. That would tell me the um, cranial nerve that may be involved. So we'd go on by saying just look at my finger or can just follow the movement of the finger without moving your head all through and at the same time I'm checking the eye movement. I'm also checking for nystagmus to see whether the eye is actually um, there's a nystagmus to the eyes up and down and then we'll look down and out down and out and then up and out and up and out. At this point she clearly has she has full external ocular movement without any um, nystagmus and she did not see any she did not have any double vision which means that all those muscles are working by implication the ocular motor the um, trochlea and the um, abducens nerves are working. Next we'll now go on to the seventh um, cranial nerve which is the nerve of facial um, expression. One of the things I start off by doing um, again is that I tell you to close your eyes tight. Okay, that's the the, um, the orbicularis oris, which is uh, mediated by the, also by the seventh. If you open your eyes, and then I'm going to have you raise your look up. You're going to furrow. You see how the um, the forehead muscle, the uh, frontalis muscle, is um, furrowed. That tells me that both um, at least the upper motor neuron part is working. However, in also doing that, I need you to give me a smile. Okay, she has good symmetry of her smile, and the um, nasal labial fold here is um, symmetrical. And can you blow out your cheek? Okay, the bucalis uh, muscle is intact and is blow out against resistance and is tense, it does not collapse. Throughout our interaction, she has been listening, she has been responding to questions, which tells me that she doesn't have any form of hearing loss now. Also understand that if she has only hearing on one side, she probably would be interacting to the same degree. So normally what I would do is that I would whisper. What's her name? Sherry. Okay. But sometimes I also interfere that by putting a piece of paper to mask the background or to increase the background noise on the other side to actually find out the sensitivity. Sherry. Okay, so um, I usually would do this on both sides. Using a tuning fork to determine the RENE, R I W N E test and the Weber test, and that is to differentiate um, bone conduction, people who have conductive hearing loss and, um, and um, sensory neural um, hearing loss. Normally, what we do is that for the RENE, we'll tap the tuning fork and we'll place it on the mastoid process, which is the bony part behind the ear and we'll continue to find out the time she, you know, she f feels the vibration and once she stops fe hearing, feeling the vibration and then I place it against the ear to see whether she will not hear the vibrations and if that is normal then you know air conduction will be better than um, bone conduction in a normal person with conductive hearing loss it will be the other way around. The other part will be also using the same tuning fork is the Weber is to put it right on the vertex to see whether she lateralizes the sound to um, either um, side. And um, in this case, if you have conductive, you will hear, you'll hear the, um, the, the conduction more to the, the abnormal um, side. There are two components to the nerve, the cochlea and the vestibular. The vestibular portion is a portion that um, is for balance. And one of it I've already tested, which is the nystagmus when I did the, um, the eye signs. Now the other parts um, I have to, um, we, need, we need to do now, there are several parts of it. The first one is actually the Romberg um, test, um, which can be a proprioception um, um, issue or it could also be vestibular. And um, I might as well test it now. If you can just stand up for me and you put your feet together. Okay, usually um, the sensation from the ground actually tells you with the vestibular um, um, system would, t would tell the brain the, where the body parts are in space. So in this case, you have to remove because with your eye, you can actually focus to try and tell you, you know, to try and maintain your balance. So in this case, we have to remove the sight um, aspect to it. So we'll, I'll have you close your eyes, okay? And I usually just have them stand. Now, if it's abnormal, they are going to start to sway because they cannot cue where their body spend, where their body parts are in space, and in fact, she's perfectly rigid. That's perfect. Thank you. If I have you sit back again. Now we now move on to the uh, nine and ten, which is um, the the um, glossopharyngeal and the vagus uh, nerve. Now that's usually done by actually looking into the mouth. When you open up your mouth, actually, I need you to open up your mouth. That is correct. Uh, what I do is first of all shine the light and I look for the and you say ah, ah. Uh, when you do that the uvula which is the 
the structure right at the back of the mouth should be midline. Um, that is mostly controlled really by the um, vagus. Now, to do the gag reflex, which actually represents the, um, which represents, which represents the sensory part for the glossopharyngeal, is the gag that everybody knows, and is that you put this to the back of the throat, and um, she will have a gag. Now, in fact, she doesn't have an increased gag in the sense that there are some people who are incredibly sensitive to it. She does have a gag, um, and the uvula went up. So usually we'll do it on both sides. Okay, the other part to the vagus nerve testing is actually the voice. Um, she's already, we can document already that her voice is good. She doesn't have any hoarseness of voice, but if she did have hoarseness of voice, then we have to do an indirect laryngoscopy by having a reflecting mirror inside the mouth to see the vocal cords, to see which one is not um, moving. Okay, so the last two that we need to perform is the accessory nerve, which is nerve number 11. And mostly I use that for shoulders. So if, you can, if I can have you shrug up, that's correct. So that's testing the trapezius muscle, actually against resistance, if you can hold it, don't let me push it down, good. So that's the stressing the trapezius. The other muscle to test is the sternocleidomastoid. And what the sternocleidomastoid does is that it actually moves the neck to the opposite side. So what I usually do is to push my hand against resistance, push it, good. And then push it the other way, very good. So the sternocleidomastoid is um, perfectly intact. Then, then the last thing is um, the um, hypoglossal um, nerve, which actually uh, mediates for the tongue. And usually the tongue should be midline. Um, when, the, when one of the nerves are um, abnormal, it will deviate to the abnormal side. So if I can have you stick out your tongue for me, that's perfectly midline. The other thing you look at um, while looking at the tongue is to see where there's any atrophy, um, whether there's any fasciculations of the, of, the, of the muscle, because that would tell you whether this is a lower motor neuron, peripheral nerve, hypoglossal, and she doesn't have it. And the last thing is furrowing of the tongue, and this is perfectly normal. Very good. Having completed the cranial nerve um, examinations, um, mental status examination and the cranial nerve, now we can also do some, what I consider, what I call the long track signs, looking at some of the pyramidal system, especially if I have someone presenting with an intracranial lesion. One of the first things I do is actually to determine whether the patient has a drift, what we call um, a pronator drift. And what you're going to do is to put your hands out in the air for me like that, okay? And then you close your eyes. Okay, the hand does not drift. It stays horizontal as I've placed it. If she had a pronator drift, it will start to pronate like that, and then it will start to fall. And that, to me, is an indication of a pyramidal tract, corticospinal tract lesion. Thank you very much. Um, now, motor strength, that also checks motor strength in the upper extremity anyway. Um, but individual motor um, um, strength we can do. But the important thing really is that whenever, whichever muscle um, group you're looking at, you want to see where there's a, the muscle bulk is good, that there's no evidence of um, um, atrophy. Um, you check to see that there's no fasciculations or twitching, which indicates more of a peripheral nerve um, um, problem and she doesn't have. And then for usual strength, for the upper extremity, I do a very easy, fast um, exam. I check the deltoid, if you hold it up that way, hold it there, don't push it down, that's deltoid. Then that's the biceps against resistance on both sides. Then the brachioradialis, I do like that, you hold it against resistance. Then the triceps, you actually bend your, and then you push it, you, you extend it for me. That's good, that's uh, st normal strength, normal strength. Then the wrist extension, up, if you hold it up, good. And then if you keep it straight, that's the finger extension. And then the last thing is the grasp. Squeeze it for me. Excellent. And the same thing goes for the um, lower extremity. Um, I usually check, I actually go from distal to proximal. I usually do the dorsiflexion. You hold it against resistance. She holds it. Um, that's the tibialis anterior. Then the extensor houses, uh, excuse me. The extensor has halosis longus. You pull up your toe towards you, over towards you. This is usually more for spine examination. And then the next thing is the hamstring. You, I want you to dig your foot in there. Don't let me straighten it. That's very good. You do it on both sides. And then the quadriceps. Then you kick against resistance. Excellent. On both sides. And then the next thing I do is actually the hip flexors. If you pull up your knee, up. Hold it there. Same thing there. Very good. And lastly, I do the adapters. If you pull your knee together, don't let me straighten it. That's excellent. So this really corresponds to muscle um, groups um, in the spine. So this would be C5, C6, 
C5 for the deltoid, C6 for the biceps, C7 for the triceps. Wrist, ex wrist extension is 6-7. Wrist flexion is 6-7. Finger extension is 7-8. Finger flexion is 7-8. And then the adductors, which I didn't do, the intrinsics of the hand. If you hold up your fingers like that, don't let me collapse it. That is actually 8-1, C8-T1. And then the same goes for the lower extremity. Um, the dorsiflexion is actually predominantly L5. The hamstring is predominantly S1. The quadriceps is predominantly L4. So in testing for the reflexes, which will be the next thing to do, is that I'm just going to look. There are certain muscle um, nerve roots then that corresponds to the, um, to the reflex center. Usually it's the biceps, the triceps, and the brachioradialis. And in testing for the biceps, which is predominantly C6, this is how I test it. I put a finger into where the tendon really inserts, just before the tendon inserts, and you straighten and you, you hit it. Um, so you have a contraction. Usually you do it on both sides. And then the triceps, it's the same thing. Sometimes you may have to support the hand, but now that she has it on herself, then that's the support. And then you just tap the triceps one and it extends. The last one is the brachioradialis that I do. I place my finger over the insertion of the brachioradialis and tap it and it pops up. One of the other ones that you can see in an abnormal reflex is what you call the inverted radial reflex, which is when I tap the fingers and for, it's, for people who also have upper motor neuron lesion, it will become exaggerated. Um, just like you also have abnormal reflexes, still staying with the upper extremity is the Huffman sign, which is an abnormal reflex. Um, you keep the finger, the middle finger ex extended, flexed, and then you tap the, the last um, digit, okay, and the IP joint. And if there's an abnormal Hoffman's, the whole hand fingers will contract at the same time, and she does not have that. Then going down to the um, reflexes in the lower extremity, then we also do the, um, um, the patella um, knee reflex. Very good. And then the other one is the, um, the ankle, where actually I straighten, I stretch the hamstring um, a little bit, and then I tap on the Achilles heel, and she does have a reflex. The last abnormal reflex that you can elicit from the lower extremity is the Babinski and response. Well, it's actually called the plantar reflex. The actual abnormal finding is the Babinski sign. There's really nothing called the Babinski response. It's a Babinski sign only when it's abnormal. So it is a plantar response. And the point is that you stroke the sole of the foot and the, f and the toe goes down appropriately like she did. If it was abnormal, if it was a Babinski response, what's gonna happen is that the toe is gonna go up and it will f all the toes will flare up, especially the big, the big toe. So that's, an, uh, that's also a feature of an upper motor neuron um, lesion. Now the sensory um, test also depends on what aspect of the, um, of the body that we're talking about. Usually, the f one of the first things I do for an intracranial problem is actually check to see whether she has a neglect or whether she actually does know that she has sensation on both. And to determine that, I do a simultaneous touching of her hand. So if you have your eyes closed and, um, and actually turn the hand in the supine position, I touch the hand at the same time to determine whether she can actually determine whether I've touched both hands. If she extinguishes or what you call a neglect, but she'll only remember that I touched only one side. Which side did I touch? Both. Both sides, very good. So that's one of the um, um, cortical sensory um, changes that I, um, I check. The other one that I check is that if I have a coin, I'll put the coin in, in her hand. You can play around with it. What kind of a coin is that? Is that a nickel, dime, or quarter? A dime. A dime. That is, in fact, correct. Very good. And for the light touch, what you want to do um, is to use a small whisk of cotton with your eyes closed. And what I usually do is that I do a sham one, I, and I tell the patient, "Do you feel anything?" And you know, do you feel? Do you feel me touching you? No. No. Okay. Do you feel me touching you? Yes. Okay. Do you feel? Me? And I always do it. Now, most times, what I do, if it depends for for a spinal. Um, for examination of the spine, you, probably, you want to go through the, uh, the, the um, dermatome C5, C6, C7, C5, C6 to the tongue, C7, C8, and T1 to make sure that the roots are intact. And the same goes for the lower extremity. I want to go, I usually will just start probably at L4 already. 
and then touch L4 which comes right up to the front of the leg L5 which is the lateral side on top of the toe the dorsal part and then S1 the uh, the lateral aspect of the foot as well as the calf and that's exactly what I'll do ex too with the um, with the pinprick L4 Feel it. L5. Feel it. S1. Feel it. Okay. Then finally, the cerebellar um, testing, you can open your eyes now. It's, um, we do, actually, I do three things. The pass, finger pass pointing, the um, rapid alternating test, and the um, heel to um, f um, toe and test. So with the, what I needed to do is that I'm going to keep my finger in front of you and I want you to touch the tip of my finger and touch your nose. And I'm going to keep moving my finger and you're going to move along with that. Okay, very good. Touch your nose, keep going. And the whole point that she's always on target touching my finger, it does not move, it does not waver. Very good, and I'll do it on both sides. The next one is what you call the diadoco kinesia, or the rapidly alternating hand movement. So I want you to go like this, very fast, faster, faster, very good. And then do it with the other hand, excellent. Then the last one now will be doing the um, heel to shin um, test. And that's if I can get you to stand up, thank you. And uh, that, yes, if you can just start from there, and you go in a straight line, very good. Usually the, the police officers know how to do this test very well, thank you. Um, that determines some um, balance. So basically, um, we have, that's, that's in a nutshell will be um, the form of type of examination I'll do in general for any patient who has a neurological problem, understanding that it could be obviously um, focused more to the area with, more, with a little bit more detail. But I think this concludes our neurological examination.